got to me, this last one. So pray for Dale. Just uh, thought of, And he watches these, so yes, we're praying for you. Get back here. you got work to do. I'm looking at the camera. He also said to tell Loretta that he's always sitting right behind her, and when she doesn't come to church, it makes him look bad. That's just Dale. Well, Father, thank you for this morning. We've come to worship you, to lift up your name, to seek your face. You are so good to us, and we, we just appreciate it. Thank you, Father. Lord, have your way. Lead us by your Holy Spirit uh, into worship, into the Word. Uh, Lord, into praying for one another, lifting one another up. What an opportunity for the people of God to gather. Thank you so much in Jesus' name. And they all said, Amen. Amen. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. I am so wondrously safe from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his... All right, sing it. Here we go. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. the right verse of sin I am so glad I have entered in there Jesus saves me and keeps me clean glory to his name Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his to his name his name alone hallelujah oh boy worship's a funny thing comes in all shapes sizes and colors and this that and the other sounds thank you <laughs> sounds kind of the obvious one right uh there's many styles many types but what's important is that we don't get lost in the music. It's all about him. Worship's about him. 
And we love music because God's given. That's a gift that God has given. It's a language that he has provided in his creation. So that's a good thing. And it's wonderful to have it. But we always got to remember that it's designed to bring glory to his name. And so as we worship, always remember that. When the music fades, all is stripped away. And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you It's all about you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, that it is all about you. And Father, you know, we're your creation, we're your people. And we just want to worship you and not get caught up in all the foolishness around us, constant, it seems. Sing a simple song of love To my Savior To my Jesus I'm grateful for the things you've done My loving Savior Oh precious Jesus heart is glad that you've called me your own there's no place I'd rather be than your arms of love in your arms of love holding me still holding me arms of love I sing a simple song of love 
to my Savior, to my Jesus. I'm grateful for the things you've done, my loving Savior. Oh, precious Jesus, my heart is glad that you've called me your own. There's no place I'd rather be than in your arms. Sing it. In your arms. your heart no place you'd rather be than in his arms amen one thing about God's love is that it's bottomless there's no end to it uh, his grace as we will see in the message today as we're looking at Nathan and David we're going to see that uh, God's grace never gives up. It's like the hound of heaven. If we belong to him, and that's key, if you belong to him, he will never give up coming after you, no matter how much you backslide. You say, well, I... I, you don't understand, Pastor. I've really backslid. Compare yourself to David, then we'll talk. And that's what we'll see in the message today. Is his unending love, his unending grace, and that he will continue to just hunt down each of his children to get that relationship flowing again. Unending love. Father, I come to you, lifting up my hand, in the name of Jesus, by your grace I stand, just because you love me. And I love your son, I know your favor, unending love,
It's the presence of your kingdom as your glory fills this place. And I see how much you love me as I look into your face. Nothing could be better Oh, there's nothing I would trade for your favor. Unending love. Unending love. Your unending love. One more. Unending love. Your receive that love, that grace. We offer it back up in prayer, Father, and we pray for Dale as he goes through these last couple weeks of tying up loose ends from the uh, radiation and the chemotherapy and and all that goes into that. Lord, we, we pray, Father, that you would lift his spirits, that you would encourage him. He is more than a conqueror. And, Lord, we believe that, and he, he takes that seriously. So, Father, just meet him right where he's at. Lift him up and encourage him. May, I pray, Father, that you would continue to give him the word of Christ to preach continually to all the people that he deals with through a day. He's always witnessing, and we just ask you would continue that through him, uh, that, that you would bless him with all of that. And, Father, we have others that are out that aren't doing well, we just lift them up. Cheryl still hasn't shown up for church, but Lord, we pray for her. It's hard for her to get around because that that cast is a tall one. And uh, Lord, we pray for her that she'd be building up strength so she can get around and get well and continue to enjoy life and be with the people of God. She just loves and wants to be here. So we thank you for those, Lord. Uh, There's so many. Uh, Just bless your people, Father, with your unending love. As we just sang about, Father, for you are indeed worthy. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now am found Was blind But now I see Your turn, t'was grace T'was Bird. 
waters. Here we go. When it out upon us and our lives have been a roller coaster of events and yet you've always been steadfastly there pouring out your grace upon your children your people we just say thank you thank you so much lord and lead us by your spirit through the rest of the service as we fellowship together as as we hear the word as we pray for one another we, we ask that you would be in the center of all of that. In Jesus' name, and they said, amen. amen. Let's take time to fellowship a little bit, a little more. Patty has an announcement. Okay. Um, Angie has offered us a great deal that we can take control of everything that's left and have a garage sale and that she would split the money half and half with the church. So what we need is workers. Cheryl has graciously offered to um, head the whole thing up. And so if you want to see her, we're going to need, there's a lot. So we're going to need um, people that can price things and, um, you know, do whatever you do for garage sales. I don't do garage sales, so that's why <laughs> Cheryl's going to do it. But anyway, um, she probably knows a lot more about it than I do. Um, see Cheryl and she will start organizing something that people can go over there. I'm going to give her the key uh, to the trailer. Or trailer. So um, anyway, that's that. There's more food out there in the freezer and on the pool table. Um, all the yarn belongs to Fran. There's a note on that. So, But help yourself to anything else. And after church today, Jenny's not going to be able to stay, so if somebody would like to take her place in helping cleaning up uh, the kitchen afterwards, we'd really appreciate that. So that's it. This is Steve's house. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is Steve's house. Angie's his stepdaughter, so um, I know I look ridiculous. On, the last time I made an announcement, I was like, oh, my gosh, what a comedy hour. I'm doing the, I, I get nervous. I talk with my hands. Sorry. <laughs> That's your fine. <laughs> anyway, if you have any questions, come to me or Cheryl, and we'll try to answer them. Very good. There we are. We're off and running. <laughs> we were talking about this at dinner the other night. Not about here, but about <laughs> my sister-in-law uh, years ago. Her then boyfriend sent a, one of those deals. You click on it. It's not supposed to say anything, but you can watch while you're bored in one of your office meetings. Total humiliation. <laughs> so anyways, you want to watch those ringtones. Like what's David's? David's. Dale's a crying baby. I always like that one, though. Yeah, that was a good one. 
All right, back to where we were. We're going to take verses 1 through 5. That what's happening is we will see that, that, that God sends Nathan to David. That is about three pages worth when we explore that. What's going on there? And then, of course, we'll look at the story that Nathan brings to David about the, the rich man who pilfers some poor man's little ewe lamb and, and cuts that, butchers it, and barbecues it for his out-of-town guests because he didn't want to take one out of his many, many you know, flocks and herds and all that. And so we're going to watch David respond to that, and then we're going to watch Nathan go to work on him. But that's next time, so hold on. So what we've got is David, you know, perched on the top of his rooftop palace. He's, he's king of his domain, of all that he observes. He's like a mafia don, okay? He, he's controlling everything. And why is he doing that? Because he's trying to hide his sins from the people of Israel, the things he's done, his adultery, his murder. He's covering it up. You know, people just kind of disappear when stuff like that happens. And so that's what David is doing. He's tying up loose ends surrounding this whole ordeal. Now, David's lieutenants have faithfully carried out his commands, but there's two things that David can't control. And you might find this something you've experienced in your lifetime. He cannot control office gossip, or palace gossip in this case, and he cannot control God's ever-tightening noose of judgment. We ended last time with this statement. This statement is ominous. You could just feel it. But the Lord was not pleased with the thing David had done. Nah, 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 nah. You know something's coming, and it's not going to be good. We see, we are witnessing as we enter chapter 12, David's fall from the mountaintop into the valley of despair. Now, we're very familiar with this story. We know what's happening. We know what's coming. We know what he did and the judgment that God is bringing. But the question, the intriguing question, may just be this. What is David thinking and feeling while he awaits the divine hammer to fall. Put yourself in his place. You have just reached the pinnacle of your relationship with Yahweh. And all of a sudden, everything hit the fan. He's in so deep. He knows. We talked about this last time. He's deserving of death. He's violated the commands of God. He's murdered someone. He murdered a friend to cover up what he had done with the friend's wife. You, you can't just write this stuff. This is amazing. This is God's chosen king. That is important to remember. He's the man after God's own heart. And yet... How can he rationalize and justify his actions? Because you know he is. You know how we know? Because we do it. We understand what's going on here. We may not have gotten in as deep in our lives as what David's all the way up to, right? But we know the process of, of having backslid and then knowing, you know, there's... The, you know, it's, it's coming to a head. We're going to have to face God eventually. What are we feeling at the time? How are we trying to rationalize and justify what has happened? We all do it. We all do it. It's part of being a sinner, a simple human being. It's just one of the deals. But you've got to recognize it and see it and then stop it. He has committed adultery and murder, and he has despised the Lord who provided him all the benefits of kingdom rule. You know he's an emotional, physical, and spiritual wreck. Now, we don't get that. It's not described to us in the text, and that's okay. But we know because we're just like David. David's just like us. And we know what happens when we're at odds with the Lord, when we're out of fellowship with 
our Father. We know what that feels like. And see, David should be a wreck. Sin of this magnitude affects the whole person. Body, soul, spirit, everything is a wreck. Now at this juncture, we're left wondering, what's, what's he going to do? What's happening? But then we, we have the opportunity, and you can do this on your own, when we read Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, we get a glimpse into David's broken spirit and his crippling fear of divine reprisal. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Why would that be important to him? Remember, he watched King Saul and the Lord pulled back his spirit from Saul and he saw what happened. He's terrified. Hold that thought. And this is how it should be. Sin should not be a picnic, amen? It's not supposed to be. It's direct rebellion against God himself. We don't see sin the way God sees it. We need to understand it. We just say, ah, you know, sin, okay, it's not that bad, whatever. You know, I'll get over it, you'll get over it. God doesn't view sin this way because he's holy and he's righteous completely. And sin is an affront it's a direct attack upon his righteousness. He's offended by sin. We want to see justice dispensed. That's why we watch cowboy shows. We want to see the white hats finally give it to the black hat guys. Or law and order, or I don't know anything else that's out there, but... We, that's why we watch. We want to see justice dispensed because the world is full of garbage and people are getting away with stuff and we can't stand it. And we, we watch the news and we see politicians getting away with stuff that we'd be in jail forever for. We want to see some justice somewhere. That's never changed. That's humanity. In this case, in David's case, we want to see justice dispensed. And justice in this case would be death, according to the law of God. You know what? David even agrees with this verdict. Look at verses 5 and 6. We expect retribution, we expect punishment, and we expect death. But what we will discover throughout this chapter is the unexpected and unmerited grace of God saving a sinner from divine wrath. Uh, oh, wait a minute. He did that for me. Oh, uh, amen. Praise the Lord. We're wrapped around the axle here. Oh, no. See, our hypocritical self is dismayed about David not paying the ultimate price. But our transformed self is singing hallelujah, 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 because we are David. We will see that we, like David, are in desperate, desperate need of God's amazing grace daily. Now, David, as we know, and this is all coming up in the chapters that are coming, David will suffer the consequences of his sins throughout the rest of his life, and it will define his later years. Yet, we will also see God's grace poured out upon a guilty king foreshadowing the vicarious atoning work of Christ on the cross. Fancy phrase for him being on the cross instead of us. The wages of sin is physical and spiritual death. However, eternal life in God's kingdom is for those who believe on the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Redemption is the gift of God. Through the blood of Christ, even so, the consequences of sin 
are experienced in this life. What we will see in God's handling of a guilty king is the very grace that we receive from our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. So, I've entitled the first point, God Has David Sent. It's a play on words. Look at verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. Seems simple enough. Short statement. Okay. Next. No, no. Slow down. Back up. David is in deep kimchi. He has no idea what God's going to do to him. He's, he's playing it off, though. Everything's hunky-dory in the kingdom. I'm cool. Everyone's cool. But he knows. He knows God. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. Ooh. In other words, God sent his word. See, the prophet in the Old Testament was the actual word of God on two legs. God would give the prophet his word, and he would carry it. Yes, they had, they had been writing you know, the, the books of Moses and all that kind of stuff. They had, they had a lot of that, but a lot of it hadn't been compiled yet. And there's, you know, Historically, there's all sorts of things going on here. So in the meantime, while things are getting you know, solidified, he would send his prophet and his prophet would come, and he would be the word of God to the target. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. Now, we're students of the word, and they all said, yeah, you better say so. <laughs> and we know that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Da, 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 da. That's ominous. We know that's true. We know that doesn't change. Therefore, when God breaks his silence regarding David's sin, what are we expecting? Thunderbolts. Lightning. Earthquakes. The stars falling from the heaven. A holocaust. We are expecting some big-time fireworks. However... Instead of all that, we read that the Lord sent the prophet Nathan to David. In our appetite for righteous judgment, we overlook the fact that God's mightiest weapon is his word. All he's got to do is speak and create a universe. That's pretty powerful stuff. That's his word. We know his word, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and surgically it cuts its way into the very thoughts and intentions of our heart, Hebrews 4.12. So there is no hiding. There is no escape. David's sins are about to be exposed on God's operating table. Now here, the word sent. This is a clue, it's a key. The word sent is intentionally used by the writer, via the Holy Spirit, obviously, to demonstrate the contrast between David the sinner and a holy God. Divine irony is also going to be on display. Now let's go back, go back a few verses. Let's think about some things. Let's remember. Let's remember some things. It was David who sent... Joab to battle the Ammonites in his place. It was David who sent his servants to inquire about the bathing beauty Bathsheba. It was David who sent his servants to bring the woman to himself. It was David who instructed Joab to send him Uriah the Hittite. It was David who sent Uriah's death sentence to Job. Joab, sorry. Finally, when his sin had reached its evil crescendo, 
David sent for Bathsheba that he might enjoy stolen wedded bliss with the wife of a murdered friend. Word's important. We're seeing it popping up through this whole chronology of events. But now, David's sending is complete. It's over. Now it's God's turn to send. He will send the prophet Nathan to utterly shatter David's house of sinful cards and convict him with truth. Now, we would think... We, I like to say we, but it's just me. We might believe that the message God should have sent David would be an assassin to slit his throat. Justice. Or maybe a wasting disease that would consume his internal organs. Remember Herod in the book of Acts? Justice. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Some justice. And God would be just and right to send such wrath upon his disobedient king. Anybody remember a guy named Saul? King Saul? We've seen this story play out. But instead, instead of an assassin or organ-eating disease, in a display of amazing grace, God sent Nathan, the vessel of God's word, to convict David of his sin. You see, we might have thought that Yahweh was a passive onlooker. Didn't seem like he was doing anything to stop any of this. But he's not a passive onlooker. He sends his word to sinners on the wings of of grace. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Because all have sinned. Fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And without righteousness, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Someone has to fix that problem. And we can't, obviously. Point two. You would think that David would catch on. You, E-W-E. -E. That's a joke, son. <laughs> Anyways, let's read it. He, that's Nathan, came to him, David, and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought, and he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. And they all said, Oh, oh, that's so sweet. And that's the point. Nathan's building it up, building it up, building it up. Because you, there's so many in this room that you're just pet lovers. You love your pets. You, you feed them from your own cup, and you give them food out of your own dish, and you do all that disgusting stuff. <laughs> you love your pets. Nothing wrong with that. I'm just joking around. But see the storyline? This is awesome. Now there came a traveler to the rich man. And he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Everybody's blood pressure going up? It ought to be. Your blood pressure should be rising at this point. This is injustice. This is terrible. This is awful. Shoot him. Yeah. Exactly. That's what we would think, right? Storytelling is an art form that when used skillfully can slip truth past the roadblocks of our mind. And that's what's happening here. C.S. Lewis stated it this way. 
Stories have a unique knack of getting under our skin and hitting us at a deeper level than our thoughts. They can strengthen old certainties and open doors we thought were locked. Stories have the power to express the inexpressible and provide answers to questions that can be answered in no other way. Stories, whether told in word, picture, song, or verse, have the ability to satisfy a deep longing in each of us. Well, Nathan understood that, and he's employing a story. Now, in the classic 1890 poem, and many of you may have read this in the English lit class or somewhere, high school or college, it's hard to read, it's that old English stuff, you know, turn of the century, but it's a classic. It's considered a high art form as far as poetic writing, so, but I won't, I won't read it to you, I'll just hit the high points. But in that 1890 poem, The Hound of Heaven, Francis Thompson wrote of the pursuit of the human soul by God's love. It is said that Thompson's use of free and varied line lengths and irregular rhythms reflect the panicked retreat of the soul. Sound familiar? Music does this all the time. Composers do this stuff all the time. You know it. You, as soon as you hear something on TV, you know, uh, the Bonanza theme song, you're kind of up and you're, you're ready to go. Or, or just some, the, the song's got a driving rhythm and it's got you kind of tapping your foot and now you're, you're waiting for some action to happen. Yeah. He's doing it with words. That's why they call them wordsmiths. Meanwhile, while the structured, often recurring refrain suggests the inexorable pursuit as it, the hound, or the Holy Spirit, comes ever closer. As the hound follows the hare, never ceasing in its running, ever drawing nearer in the chase, with unhurrying and unperturbed pace, so does God follow the fleeing soul by His divine grace. And though in sin or in human love, away from God, it seeks to hide itself. Divine grace follows after, uns wervingly or unwearyingly follows ever after till the soul feels its pressure forcing it to turn him to him alone in that never ending pursuit he wears you down many of you have that story in your testimony about being saved he just wore me down i had no other option i had to turn to him here's a few of the important lines that are found in thompson's the hound of heaven I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. For though I knew his love who followed, yet I was sore adread. The hound of heaven had David sent. And finally cornered him with Nathan's story that was guaranteed to flush forth David's hypocritical and self-righteous moral outrage. Thus eliciting self-condemnation and eventually, though, fortunately, repentance and restoration. Now the skill exhibited in Nathan's account of injustice profoundly triggers David. And that was its intention. Instead of marching into the king's presence and declaring him a filthy womanizing murderer, which of course would arouse David's suspicions, what's going on here? Nathan presents a plausible account of cruel injustice occurring within the borders of Israel somewhere. Thus, Nathan protected himself from the king's wrath, because right now the king, the king's just not in his right mind. You may not want to upset him. Nathan understands that. He protects himself from the king's wrath while at the same time slipping past David's well-rehearsed defenses. You know what those are, don't you? Yeah. It was Nathan's strategy via the Holy Spirit 
to arouse within David his anger toward injustice so that he would condemn himself. That nation, what a sneaky little guy he is. Now, the story was calculated to appeal to David's virtues. The king thought of himself as the defender of the weak and champion of justice. And as a former shepherd, he knew of the affection and joy a pet lamb could bring to the shepherd and his family. You know, that's why they took that little lamb in right before Passover. Was it 14 days? I'm trying to remember the numbers. But it was a while. So they get used to that little lamb drinking from their cup and eating from their hand and cuddling up with them at night and everybody petting it. It's my turn to hold the lamb. You know, and all that stuff going on. And then dad says, all right, let's go. We've got to kill it. Of course, the kids howled and screamed and yelled. God wanted them to understand the cost of sin. It is said that Nathan's sword of judgment was inches away from David's conscience even before David realized Nathan had a sword. As observers, we see that Nathan's story is a veiled account of David's sin committed against Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. David is the rich man with many wives, but Uriah had only one wife whom he dearly loved. Now, it has been suggested that the traveler in this story who prompted the rich man to pilfer his neighbor's only lamb, that was actually David's unchecked sensual passions. Could be. Very interesting thought. He lacked the self-control to resist these passions when they came visiting We've seen that before with him. And of course, the rest is history. Nathan's skillfully delivered story reveals David's cruel and callous greed. It was David who took the poor man's lamb, the little ewe lamb that once lay in the poor shepherd's arms, had been taken by the rich man. Uriah's only wife, whom he loved dearly, now lay in David's arms. This story is horrendous in its power. It's amazing. As we pick up at verse 5, the question is, David, you sure you want to go here now? You sure you want to open your mouth at this juncture? I know you're all hot and bothered, but you know, you've got a problem with shooting your mouth off before, you know, David, you might want to rethink this. Let's look and see what happens. Verse 5, then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. Yeah, he does. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Oh, dude. Are you sure you want to go here? Like a geyser, an oil gushing, you know, oil well. Put a little crown on top. Like a geyser blowing out the top of an oil tower, David's blood pressure spikes from this heartless behavior of the rich man. First, notice he gets all religious. He says, you know, it's in the name of the Lord. You know, he, he uses Yahweh's name in an oath. Where is it? Oh, as the Lord lives. That was a common, common refrain, that invoking the name of God over this situation. Oh, David, getting religious now. Nice timing. So he gets all religious, couching his accusations in the oath, as the Lord lives. And it's obvious David does not realize this story is about him. Now, how could you miss that? Well, if you're that deep in sin, you're missing a lot of stuff going on around you. And if he did, if he did know it was about him, he surely wouldn't invoke Yahweh's name. That's just stupid. But it gets worse. David also gets judicial and judges the rich man as worthy of death. 
I'm not sure when David would execute such an offender since restitution is also prescribed. So you want to get the stuff before you kill him. But anyways, I assume David wants his pound of flesh prior to putting the offender to the sword. And he also prescribes the penalty found in the law of the four to one retribution. It's found in Exodus 22.1. If a man steals an ox or a sheep, and kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep, fourfold. He's invoking Yahweh's name. He's invoking Yahweh's word. Dude, slow down and shut up. Holy moly. Note David's indignance when judging the sins of another, the very sins he committed. I know none of us have ever done that. All of us are pretty, pretty righteous in here, I know. We have never judged someone else's sin while we were still doing stuff like that. I suppose taking the beam out of his own eye before removing the speck in another's eye never occurred to him. Of course, that's Jesus. but And it rarely does with us. We just get going, and we get on a high horse, and we start blasting, and this, that, the other, and oops. And in a sick twist of irony, David accuses the rich man of heartlessness and cruelty. Really? You want to go there? Heartlessness and cruelty? Oh, my. Nathan and Yahweh have David right where they want him. And the trap is sprung. David's being set up for God's grace. No! No! God, don't don't pour out grace on this scalawag. Give him what he deserves. And then... God's piercing eyes focus on us, and he says nothing, just looks at us. And then we, like David should have done, go, uh oh, uh, never mind, never mind. You pour out as much grace on that sinner as you want, because I need a bunch of that grace myself. God will circumvent our resistance that's found in our justification and rationalization, and he turns the floodlights of truth upon our own darkness. And this is the craftiness of divine grace. You see, a spiritually alive Christian is marked by the realization that even though we sin, we welcome God's call to repentance when he reveals our sin. That's how you know you're alive. I didn't say you're perfect. That's how you know you're alive as a believer. Because you are a child of God, he will do whatever is necessary to bring you back to repentance. Now let me stop here for a second. Because you are a child of God, that's not everybody running around on the streets. That's not just a term saying, well, everybody's a child of God. No, everybody is not a child of God. You do understand that, I hope. Everyone is created in the image of God and therefore deserves uh, kindness and, and, and to be dealt with, you know, with integrity and, and goodness and, and, and love and, and all those things. That's all true because everyone's made in the image of God. But there is a difference between everyone and the children of God. The children of God belong to him. The children of God were selected before the earth was ever formed. And God gave them to his son. He said, here, go get them. That's a simple way of putting it all, but that's exactly how it worked. And if you are a child of God, in other words, if you've been born again, if you're saved, if you belong to him, he will do whatever is necessary to bring you back to repentance. 
God's grace affords us the opportunity to live lives of repentance. Repentance is a daily living. It's a lifestyle. Walking in daily repentant transparency before God is our joy, our strength, and our song. Isn't grace a sneaky but wonderful attribute of our Savior, Lord, and King? Aren't you glad for His grace, His amazing grace? So, as we wrap it up, we have examined the first verses of 2 Samuel 12. And in them, we see the results of David's fall from grace, as it were. But that's just a, a figure of speech. And it's really not theologically sound. An elect child of God will not fall from God's grace. We might fall into the camp of people who need to go to the woodshed and get paddled. We are those who need to be disciplined by the Lord. He disciplines his own. But you can't be removed from his grace if you belong to him. The true servant of God cannot fall from or escape God's grace. That is the lesson of our biblical text. David has succeeded in his unfaithfulness. You ever succeeded in being unfaithful? Not something to brag about or write home about, but I just want to bring it up. David was a success in unfaithfulness. But the hound of heaven ran him to ground. And once cornered, Yahweh sent Nathan to prepare the trap that would ensnare David and leave him no choice but repentance. That's our God. That's the love of of God being displayed. If you've ever been in that position, you'd be saying, but I don't deserve this kind of love. I don't deserve this amazing grace. I don't deserve any of this, God. And God says, yeah, I know. That's why it's grace. It's a gift I'm giving to you. Take it. Now we see the dogged pursuit of grace in the first words of this chapter, and we remember, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. And this should provide great comfort to every believer. God does not give up on his elect, those he has chosen from before the foundation of the world. He never loses any of us given to Christ before the world began. Jesus goes through a lot of this in, in the Gospel of John, and you may have gone past you, you may not, have, but I want to throw out a couple of them, let you just think on them. That backs up what I'm saying here. John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me, all here being individuals, not toys and food and stuff like that. Jesus is speaking. He's talking about all those that the Father gives me, will come to me. There's no guesswork. There's no possibility that they can slip through a crack. Now you think on this. This is heavy, heavy doctrine. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, and whoever is those that have been given to him, not just anybody off the street. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. That, those are words of comfort, my friends. Jump down to John 17, the high priestly prayer, verse 12. I just picked two, but there's ugh, this so much. Jesus is praying to his Father in heaven, whom he had left heaven and come here and was about to return to his place of glory. He says, while I was with them, I, he's talking about the disciples. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, 
that the scripture might be fulfilled. Of course, that's Judas. He's praying to the Father, saying, thank you. I mean, go through the high priestly prayer. It's Jesus and the Father having this communication, this prayer, this prayer time. And, and Jesus knows he's about to be crucified. And, and, and then the great work of the Trinitarian God will have come to fruition. And he will have redeemed a people unto himself. He shall be their God and they shall be his people. And this is what Jesus is talking about. And then he says, I don't pray for the world, but I am praying for them. What? Catch that? Go back and read it. He knows who are his. The Father gave them to him. When did he give them to him? Before the beginning of the foundation of the world, before the universe existed. That should make you feel good. That should make you feel special. That should help you to understand the awesomeness of God's amazing grace. Now, God's pursuing grace may not be enjoyable. Everybody been there? Okay. His word exposes our sins to the light, but repentance heals the breach between us and our Heavenly Father. Think of the alternative here. What if God abandons us when we succeed at sin? Uh-oh. We would still reap the consequences of sin in this life, but we would be left with only the fearful expectation of fiery judgment in the next. You want the hound of heaven pursuing you with his grace, no matter how much it hurts, because the alternative is unthinkable. As we shall see in the upcoming verses of chapter 12, the grace-filled healing conviction of God's word will turn David from his sin and guide him through the difficult consequences of his rebellion. But God will be faithful because David was God's elect king. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Just a few verses, Lord, packed full of a testimony about your love and grace that you have poured out on us, your people. Lord, I'm just blown away when I see this stuff and I just have to think about it. And Oh, Lord, God, we don't deserve your grace. That's the point, he said. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for driving this home. So that as we go through the rest of the chapter and see what happens, we'll understand what's really going on behind the scene. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.